Our first speaker is Stephen F. Daniel. Steve began his career in government information and military intelligence, and then spent 30 years with the former Congressional Information Service, CIS, where he was director of congressional publications. For the past eight years, Steve has been lead as his senior editorial advisor. In which capacity, inter alia, he has given almost 40 lectures on the serial set. One was titled, A Pigeon, a Beaver, and a Buffalo Walk Into a Bar. <laughs> Another was around the world in 80 days with the serial set. <laughs> now because Steve, on his vacation, often took digital photographs to use in his presentations, David Green blanched when he heard about the talk in the footsteps of Phileas Fogg. The bars and pigeons he could accept, but 80 days around the world seemed a bit more than the travel budget would allow. <laughs> this topic this morning is dredges, gunboats, and mosquitoes. The U.S. Congressional Serial Set and the building of the Panama Canal. We'd like to hold, you to hold your questions until the end of both of our presentations. Steve? Thank you, August. Um, uh, good to see all of you here this, this, this morning. This, I apologize for the weather. Washington is my home. And, uh, we, we live here despite the weather, not, not because of it. It's, 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 and this is more dreadful than usual. Um, how many of you, uh, if I can ask, have been in the Panama Canal, the, the canal, the canal, the canal? Well, not, not too many, but uh, it's, it's, it's clearly one of the great technological achievements of the, uh, of, of the, of the 20th century. Um, and, and yet, it's, 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 the measure of its greatness is, is one of scale, the, the enormity of, 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 of the effort. That when you're actually in the canal, if you've been in the Erie, on the Erie Canal in New York, or, or even the C&O Canal here, here in Washington, it's all pretty much the same. It's just much, much, much bigger, and 25,000 people die building it. Um, this topic, I want to talk about the canal because the canal is fascinating. And the idea of, of, of a canal across Central America goes back a very, very long way, almost about Boa's time. Um, but I also want to talk about the, about the Congressional Serial Set. And, and to remind us, for, for those of us who have spent our adult lives uh, working with the Congressional Serial Set, it's tempting to think of it as a legislative collection. And that's because it is. It's a foundational legislative collection. And since the 1950s, it's completely dominated by House and Senate committee reports on legislation and by documents that are presidential communications and messages about legislation. But this wasn't the case in the 19th century in the first part of the 20th century. During that time, the serial set was essentially the depository library program before there was a depository library program. It was the principal vehicle for distributing government publications to the public. Congress intentionally reprinted in the congressional serial set executive branch publications in order to ensure their distribution. So the 19th century, early 20th century serial set is filled with annual reports of cabinet departments, uh, reports of exploring and survey expeditions, the official records of the Union Confederate Armies during the War of the Rebellion, his first issue as part of the serial set, the Year of Agriculture as part of the serial set. It's an extraordinary collection of American history publications. There are, there are over 800 publications in the serial set dealing with the Panama Canal, and we'll talk about just a few of them. It's like some sense of sense of sigh of relief here uh, this morning. Very quickly, numbers on the serial set. I used the numbers through about 1980, which was uh, uh, the, the original collection that we conceived at, at Yearbook, it's at, at, at Newsbank. Um, it, it's clearly an enormous collection, over 12 million pages. In the 19th century, probably three quarters of the published pages are non congressional publications, or reprints of non congressional publications. Um, that puppy. Um, if I use the, uh, the Redex uh, finding aid, and I search on the word canals in free text, I'm searching every single word in those 12 million pages, I get 32,000 publications in which the word canal occurs. If 
I narrow that and I just search under subject index, I'm looking for the word canal in, in any form, uh, I can still get 3,690, almost 3,700 publications that deal with the canal, canals and, and, their, and their various uh, forms. If I search under Panama Canal, I get 828 publications that deal with the Panama Canal. Um, the, uh, the Caribbean, which is the reason for the canal's existence, uh, Admiral Mahan said of the Caribbean that it was the American Mediterranean. And like the Mediterranean, it required a canal. Um, and the Caribbean is actually almost exactly the same surface area as, as, as the Mediterranean. Um, if you look at the transportation uh, impact of uh, cutting a canal through Central America, and, and I should emphasize that, that much of the early thinking dealt with a way of crossing Central America, not specifically with building a canal in Panama. Indeed, almost up to the last minute, Nicaragua was the preferred route for an American canal. Uh, we can see the enormous routes, it's 5,000 miles around South America. Uh, Panama, where we actually built the canal, uh, obviously shortens it enormously, but Nicaragua would have shortened it even more. And there was much serious consideration, at least in the middle of the 19th century, to building a, a, a canal across the Isthmus of Tehuantepec in southernmost Mexico, um, which would have been technically quite, quite impossible. But all of these, the, the whole subject of crossing the Isthmus was, was, was a fascination of armchair geographers around the world. We knew, knew nothing. About, about the region, knew nothing about the climate, uh, speculated, oh, this would be a great place to build a canal, That's, this would be an obvious place to build a canal. Uh, and, but it eventually comes down to, to Wantabek, building a route across, uh, across Nicaragua, or one of several routes through, through Panama. Uh, the, the, the route that we actually eventually used uh, is, and Panama goes actually east-west, not north-south, uh, is, is the westernmost of the, of the possible routes. The, the Darien uh, Isthmus uh, to, the, to, the, to the east of, of Panama City uh, actually provides a narrower crossing. It's only 30 miles across. Um, and yet the mountains there are three times as high as the mountains in, 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 that we actually did cross. Uh, the earliest interest in a canal referenced in the serial set is a decree by the King of Spain in 1824, 1814, uh, uh, saying, let's build a canal across Tehuantepec. Again, he had no idea what would be involved. It's not really possible to do that. In fact, today there's not even a railroad going across the one uh, The earliest reference in the serial set to congressional expression of interest in a Dispian Canal is 1835, where Congress asked President Jackson to uh, survey the possibilities of building a canal or crossing of, of the Isthmus. He sent a Philadelphia lawyer uh, down, looked at Nicaragua, sort of, and said, well, we can't build a canal there. Um, and then sort of just drifts off and negotiates for himself a contract <laughs> with a Philadelphia lawyer, mind you, uh, with, with the government of, of New Granada, uh, early in from Columbia, uh, to build a railroad across Panama, and then never in fact does that. Uh, in 1846, our envoy in uh, Bogota negotiates an agreement with Colombia that grants the United States a permanent right-of-way across the Isthmus of, of Panama. And it's that right away that's used just a few years later by an American company to build the Panama Railroad. Again, an extraordinary achievement. We won't talk about that really except in passing. Uh, an extraordinary technical achievement. 7,000 people die uh, building that, that project. It is because of the California Gold Rush. Immediately an enormous success. Uh, turns huge profits uh, and uh, is, 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 is a great, very successful undertaking. Uh, President Grant writes in his uh, memoir about crossing the Isthmus of Panama in 1850 before the railroad was completed. And he was, he was quartermaster for a regiment of infantry. And there were 700 of them crossing the canal. And they left 200 bodies behind them on the Isthmus. Just, just incredible. Can uh, Panama was this notorious death trap. The, the man, uh, 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 Theodore Judah, who, who made the transcontinental railroad possible, uh, discovered the pass through the Sierras that made the, made the railroad possible, was on his way from California to the west coast, to, I'm sorry, to the east coast, to, to secure financing for the railroad, and he took the Panama route, and he dies. It's so, totally ironic. The man who makes the transcontinental railroad possible dies in Panama of, uh, of yellow fever. 
1850, we almost come to war with Great Britain over uh, a Nicaraguan canal. The, the, the British take a serious interest in Central America during this time period. They seize a Nicaraguan uh, uh, port, uh, they, they, they seize an American gunboat, um, and we, we negotiate this treaty basically to avoid a war. And it, it agrees that, well, if, if we ever do rebuild a canal, it'll be a joint British-American uh, um, uh, project. Um, and it effectively, though, from our perspective, blocks uh, the possibility of a British-only uh, canal. In Buchanan's administration, topographical engineers uh, were sent uh, to study transit routes across Central America. They point out that 80,000 people a year cross, cross Central America. And, and, and by Central America, I mean equally, it's almost, almost equal numbers at this point uh, uh, through, through Nicaragua and through, through Panama because of the disease in Panama, even though the railroad was so much more convenient. Um, and they're asking themselves, would the U.S. be better served by something other than just the Panama Railroad. And they look very seriously at, at, at the, what they regard as the various possibilities. Um, they, they, they give us uh, sort of times and distance and, and how one goes about crossing, crossing Panama. They look at, at the route across Nicaragua. Uh, Nicaragua, and we'll see on a later map, uh, there's a, one goes up a long river in a small boat, and then there's a huge lake, in, in, in the, a natural lake in the middle of Nicaragua. And you use a steamer to cross back, and then you got a stagecoach and went down to the to the Pacific Coast and on and on to San Francisco or California, wherever. Um, a long and seemingly awkward route, and yet the climate was so much nicer uh, in uh, in Nicaragua. And the overall mileage from New York to San Francisco via uh, Nicaragua was so much shorter that it was about the same time involved, even though it was only a one day crossing of Panama on the other railroad. And then they look also at, at Tehuantepec. And Tuante, I have this slide here mostly so I can say uh, Coacoguapos. Uh, <laughs> and it's, it's, it's now by far the widest uh, crossing uh, and the driest crossing. So that they, they I said this slide there. Um, Daniel Webster gets on board. He thinks, uh, again, armchair geographer, never been in that part of the world. Uh, that Tuantepec just makes sense to him. Uh, and in the end, they conclude that Tuantepec clearly is, is, is the way to go. Uh, even though there's not enough water there to fill a canal, it would, it would have to be a sea level canal. Uh, that there's no water in the mountains there. And indeed, it's, it's, it's a remote part of Mexico. This is 1850-ish. And, and the Mexicans are still annoyed with us about the Mexican War. <laughs> <laughs> so they don't want to talk about, about, about this project, and nothing ever really happens there. Uh, in 1870, Grant sends actually six or seven expeditions to Central America, uh, one including, including one across to Wondebeck. And uh, a lovely little report, beautiful maps and, and, and illustrations. Yeah. And it concludes that uh, it, uh, it seems possible, but again, it's not clear there's enough water uh, to operate locks. And, um, Although the roads, there's no railroad there. And I'm pretty sure today, there's, even today, there's not a railroad. There's a highway across there, but there's no, no railroad. Um, a little bit later, he sends a couple of missions down to, uh, to Panama. Uh, and they look and they give us uh, sort of possibilities. Nothing really comes out of these reports. What is interesting, though, that in an aside, basically, in one of the two reports, uh, Commander Lull points out that when, when our party divided into two groups, one group slept on the mosquito nets, and the other group slept on well ventilated second floors open. And that second group came down with fever within two weeks. The first guys didn't. And he speculates that mosquito netting, what's, what's the phrase used, strained the air of germs. <laughs> and, uh, and the whole notion of mosquitoes it, it really hasn't occurred to me at this point. Uh, in the 1880s, the French launched a huge project to build a canal across, across Panama. Uh, enormous undertaking. Fernando Lessips, who had successfully built uh, the Suez Canal, had made an enormous amount of money uh, for the investors in that project. Launches the French project in, in, uh, uh, in Panama. We're now a little excited about it because uh, the Monroe Doctrine issues, foreign company building a, a truly building a railroad, a, a, a canal uh, uh, across, uh, across Panama. So the Senate looks at it, basically concludes that, well, it's not a government project. This is a privately financed corporation 
foreign corporation, admittedly, but it's not a French government undertaking. So we'll uh, and, and, and and Colombia still soon still in Grenada. Um, is an independent country, and so we'll, we'll sort of let it go forward. But they endorse uh, an agreement by an American company to build a canal in Nicaragua. Nothing comes of that. We monitor, we send on a regular basis, we send on people to, to monitor the French uh, uh, progress. All this stuff appears in the serial set. Wonderful photograph illustrations of the French equipment. The French are committed initially to building a sea level canal. The Lesseps, uh, again, but without. The first engineering study, not even the first really good map, um, just looking at big maps from France, says it's going to be a sea level canal. It works in Suez, it works here. Um, and it seems to people, and indeed the idea of a sea level canal persists until almost 1906, I guess. We're, we're well into our work before we make up our minds which way to go. Um, it, it's later determined that a sea level canal is absolutely impossible. It just can't be done. We couldn't have done it, and certainly the French couldn't have done it. Uh, French invest money in working earlier. Uh, uh, but we go down and we watch the progress of the uh, of the French work. Uh, each year the French are very open. Uh, the Lesseps in, in some cases actually accompanies the American inspectors. Uh, the, the Lesseps would remain right to the very end of, of the project. Absolutely optimistic. And, and so much so that, that there were quite serious accusations of, of fraud. That he was basically uh, 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 keeping the hopes and expectations of the French public alive, uh, and, and the, 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 the canal was funded by one bond issue after another, uh, and so it was always in the business of, of floating another bond issue. But the Americans look at it, we, we take drawings, we take photographs, uh, and a number of these, uh, <coughs> these observation reports, and in the end, uh, basically, what we're saying is that, yeah, if with enough money, uh, they probably will eventually be able to uh, to complete their project. Um, but as late as 1887, there's still six or seven years of uh, work uh, yet to be done. No, no insurmountable objects except time and money. <laughs> by, by March of 1889, uh, we have a report telling us that the canal is fading. It's a great, it's like a great bubble. It collapsed. Uh, one of Lesseps' last efforts uh, to, to finance the project was something extraordinary called a, called a lottery bond. Uh, uh, if, if you bought a bond, you got a, a ticket basically in a lottery. And, and a portion of the, of the funds raised by the bond issue went to provide prizes. But even that uh, failed. Uh, at the last minute, they bring in Gustave Eiffel. France's most famous and successful engineer of the day to build locks. They've given up on, well, not, not quite given up actually, but they've changed their mind about a sea level canal. And what they're going to do is build a lock canal and then use dredges in the lock canal to eventually dig a sea level canal. But they bring in, they would bring in Eiffel to uh, design locks for, for, the new, for the new project. And when the scale goes down, when the bubble bursts, when it collapses, Eiffel is ruined. He, he never does another engineering project in his life. He lives another 30 years. Uh, goes off and studies microbiology. Uh, but uh, never builds another thing. Um, a couple years later, the canal, the French project, stays in receivership for about three years, four years almost. Uh, and then a new company is formed, and they're basically given the assets of, of the old company, which consists primarily of the railroad, the only Panama Canal Railroad, the Panama Railroad. Panama railroad. Uh, and this is, I, I find I've encountered this in, in, in the real world, in the modern business world. This company exists for no other reason, the company Nouvelle, for no other reason than to sell itself. It exists only to try and preserve those assets and raise a little money uh, for the otherwise bankrupt investors in the original company, the company Universal. Uh, we get a very nice uh, uh, Senate report uh, describing the activities and the assets of the company. They claim that their assets are worth 100 million plus, that the canal is two, -third, two fifths uh, finished, uh, they can build a lock canal, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this is basically just a sales promotional kind of thing. Uh, and when they say two fifths, they, they actually dug, they, the French actually dug something like 14 miles of sea level canal. Uh, they put in a lot of work. Uh, when they say that three or 4,000 people are working a year, they're basically working on the railroad and on improvements to the railroad. They do a little puttering around uh, in, in, in uh, Kulebra, uh, but uh, not really, really working. 
uh, on the canal. Because they're clear, these guys couldn't raise the money to build this canal ever. Uh, these are photographs from uh, 97, 98. Uh, Americans decide that there's going to be a canal. Uh, it's going to be an American canal. Uh, John Tyler Morgan of Alabama, who was chairman of the uh, Senate Interoceanic uh, Canal Committee, uh, was probably the leading exponent in America for a canal. He wanted to build it across Nicaragua, though. Uh, his uh, committee. There are 95 publications for this committee, which is only in existence for about 15 years uh, uh, in the zero set. In uh, 1901, we negotiated something called the hay Ponceport uh, Treaty, which basically negotiates away the earlier 1850 treaty, the uh, uh, clayton Bulwer Treaty, uh, so that we get the British out of the way. The British are really no longer interested in Central America. They have all the fish to fry elsewhere in the world. They have a huge empire. Uh, and so basically they say, you want to build a canal, go ahead and build it. Uh, we set up, basically TR sets up, a uh, canal commission. Um, they look very closely at what they now regard as simply the two alternative routes. Some version of the French route across Panama, some version of the, the old American route, so-called, across Nicaragua. And they endorse the Nicaraguan route. Uh, this is 1901. They endorse the Nicaraguan route, primarily, though, because of the cost of buying the assets of the French company, which are then appraised at about $109 million. Uh, and, but for that, there are technical advantages uh, and cost advantages to building in Panama. It's a shorter canal, it's nothing else. Yeah, we have here a, a nice map from the serial set with the two canal routes in, in this, on the same scale. You see how much longer the Nicaraguan Canal would have been. And the minority report, which endorses a Panamanian, uh, canal gives us this nice map, and this is the eastern half. Sorry, yeah, no, the western half of the map. No, excuse me, the eastern half of the map. Uh, and this is Cologne, and we dig a channel, and we have basically a sea level canal all the way to here. We build a huge earth dam here, flood the Chagres River, make a huge uh, uh, natural, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, artificial lake, uh, dig a route through uh, Gatun and then come back down through some locks and go out to the sea. That's not the canal we built, but it's a canal at this point is being, uh, is being proposed. Uh, TR, uh, President Roosevelt, um, steps in, lets the French know that $40 million is the most we'll pay. They turn around and say, well, as a matter of fact, that's the amount we'll accept. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, uh, the Senate, Senate falls, falls in line. The Senate still, which is say John Tyler Morgan, still favors the Nicaraguan route. But uh, the president wants to go with Panama, and they don't think he can do it. They don't think that, that the French uh, concession will really hold up that the Colombians pull a plug on it. Uh, they won't be able to reach an agreement with, with, with Colombians. So the legislation that authorizes construction of a Panama Canal says if you can't do those things, if you can't agree with Colombia, if you can't agree, uh, uh, if you can't actually secure uh, a clear title to, to the French property, then, then you have to go with Nicaragua. Uh, we negotiated a treaty with, with, with Colombia, uh, but then we never, never actually signed it. The Colombians don't approve it. We didn't bother sending it to the Senate. It's really a sham going through. At this point, it's fairly clear. Uh, you don't see the documentary record. You don't even really, really see it in the papers. But it's fairly clear that Teddy Roosevelt has in his head that we can secure sovereignty over a canal zone in Panama. We could never do that in Nicaragua, and that's why we're going with Panama. He has no intention of striking a deal with, with, with Colombia. It's clear there are revolutionaries in Panama that with the right encouragement will, in fact, cast off from Colombia, and that's exactly what happens. And we see here in this lovely little publication we have a report of the, the naval officer who commanded the, the gunboat Nashville in, in Harvard, Cologne, who takes steps in November of 1903 to protect the lives of Americans and the safety of transit on the Panama Railroad. He's there on November 3rd. By coincidence, revolt breaks out that same day. <laughs> Colombian troops head back home. Two days later, the next day, republic's declared. We recognize it almost immediately. Uh, Colombia is told they won't be allowed to interfere in the future. And then we negotiate a treaty with Panama. <laughs> and Panama says, sure, I'll build it now. And we, and we guarantee their independence and the rest is history. Oddly enough, Buna Varela, 
is a French canal engineer. He's, he's, he's <coughs> who becomes Panama's first ambassador to the United States. <laughs> he, he sort of, he's kind of a shadowy, sometimes not so shadowy figure in the background who uh, was determined that a canal would be built to sort of salvage French prestige on the, on the, sort of on the, on the, on the, on the, on the footprint of the, of the original French effort. And uh, he, uh, he helps that gunboat to be where it was and uh, makes a couple of dollars in the process. Mm -hmm. um, we get a very interesting exchange of correspondence between Colombia and the United States about the events that have taken place. Uh, they never secure satisfaction. Uh, our relation to all the Colombia today, I suppose, is one of our leading allies in, in South America. Uh, it takes a long time for them to get over uh, the events of, of 1902 and 1903. Um, the actual building of the canal is recorded very, very nicely. Going for longer. It's recorded very nicely in uh, a series of annual reports by, by the commission. Uh, we had three chief engineers. John Wallace is the first guy, and he basically is overwhelmed. And very little actually gets done during his year or so in charge. Uh, John Stevens stepped in. He's a railroad man. He puts all of the of the pieces in place. Does very very little digging, but he makes possible the canal project. He uh, he also is the one who gives uh, Gothel's. I'm sorry, uh, Gorgas, uh, all the sporting needs and, and, and defeats yellow fever. Uh, so it's very little digging. The actual digging is done primarily by, uh, by George Goffels, uh, who comes in in 1907. Uh, but as late as 1906, we're going to work this for two years now, the Senate is still talking about uh, building a sea level canal, which is later determined to be impossible. Uh, fortunately, calmer heads or senior heads uh, prevail, and basically listening to John Stevens, who was the chief engineer at, the, at that time, uh, who was saying, we just, we, we, can't, we can't build a seal level canal, we have to build a lock canal. So in the end, by a very narrow vote, 36 to 31, the Senate approves a bill saying build a seal level canal. Uh, this is June of 1906, so we finally, at that point, then begin serious work. We finally, finally decide what kind of canal we're going to build. Uh, and this is the canal we actually built. Again, an enormous earthwork dam is built here, which was this is not so terribly long after the Johnstown flood, when Earth, Earth and Dam collapsed and killed a lot of people. And so people were very much concerned about this dam, and yet it, it, it's proven to be highly successful. We create a 150 square mile artificial lake in the middle of Panama, which did not exist there before, provides all of the, all of the water uh, for, for the canal. The canal has now three locks here going through the dam, uh, a passage here, uh, we come cut this huge calabria cut, which was plagued with landslides year after year after year. <coughs> One year, I think it's 1911, we spent four and a half months doing nothing but removing landslide debris. Don't, 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 do, don't do any original digging at all for four and a half months. Uh, that was really the, 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 the huge technical achievement, was, was completing this, this narrow cut through the spine of the mountains. Uh, and this is the same chain of mountains. It runs from Alaska to Tierra del Fuego. Uh, and it's one of the very low spots in, the, in that mountain chain. And then there's, there's a single lock here at Pedro Miguel, a small lake, and then two more locks at, at Miraflores to take us back down to sea level. The level of the lake is about 85 feet above sea level. <coughs> so I come up three locks, have an 85 foot above sea level passage, and come down through three more locks, back down to, to, uh, to, uh, to sea level. And there are no pumps in the canal. All the water comes flows out of the lake. Um, and the, there are uh, uh, generators here in the turbines, rather, in the in the dam that generate all the electricity that the canal uses. And very very small uh, motors are needed to uh, to operate the uh, the gates, they're basically they're enormous, they're made of steel, the hull, they basically float before they fill the, the locks. Uh, the Senate still is concerned about <coughs> money, whether it's being spent well or not, so we don't usually get hearings in the serial set, but um, some particularly interesting ones, again, for public distribution, are reprinted and, and, and made part of the serial set. So we had a couple of hearings there. Uh, there's no formal, after the enormity of this project, all the money, all the lives lost, there's no formal opening of the canal. They had planned a huge gathering of fleets of the world in American water, you know, parade through the canal and wind up at the Pacific Exposition in San Francisco. But by August 14, when the canal is ready, the fleets of the world are doing other things. You know, already there's blood, blood flowing in, in the battlefields of Europe, and it just doesn't happen. There is no formal opening of the canal. So for traffic, these are American warships going through 1915. These are freight carriers much more recently. One of the great issues in building a canal was defeating yellow fever. And we get some lovely little publications, if you can call them that, on, on yellow fever. Walter Reed, uh, who dies in 1902 of appendicitis, ironically, uh, had demonstrated that 
yellow fever was carried by mosquitoes and demonstrated how to defeat it. This very complicated table, but it's a wonderful table. Uh, he used two different scales here. Uh, this scale shows the average number of deaths per month between 1880 and 1899 in Havana. Uh, each of these lines equals 20 deaths. So for that 20 year period, every July, an average of 893 people die. One year after they began the eradication program of the Stegomyia mosquito, this other line for which each bar represents two people, shows that in July, <coughs> on average, 1900, 1901, 36 people died. From 902, on average, to 49. Um, and his, his experiments are very, very elegant in terms of proving that it was a mosquito. Uh, they demonstrate that it's both the mosquito carries a disease, uh, and it's just this mosquito, it's just this one particular mosquito, the stegomyia. Uh, which has a particular lifespan. Uh, a subsequent publication by uh, Gorgas, who actually did the work in, in, in Panama, is a very, again, wonderfully well written little publication, it's only 14 pages long. I often talk about serial set publications as being beach reading. There are all kinds of things in the serial set. <laughs> the Titanic hearings are, are one in particular, They're just, they're just extraordinary reading. This, on the other hand, you might not want to take to the beach a publication on, on disease bearing mosquitoes. Um, <laughs> But it's one well written. It explains Reed's work, uh, overview of the life cycle of the, of the mosquito, how they were controlled, and just sort of in, in, in the course of dealing with that one particular mosquito, you inevitably killed off a lot of other mosquitoes. The, the Anopheles mosquito was one that carries malaria. And malaria remained a problem throughout the, throughout the, uh, uh, the building of the canal. And we lose about 5,000 people in, in, in the American effort, but very, very few of them died. Uh, she had another publication on the mosquito, and this is the, this is the little girl that, that causes all the problems. What's extraordinary about this mosquito is it, it's, 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 it's adapted over, over the eons to be completely dependent on human beings. Uh, if we had our breakfast every day, I guess you're, I mean, it, it will only lay eggs after feeding on human blood. It will only lay its eggs in still water and artificial containers. It has such short wings, it only flies about 50 feet in its lifetime. They say that, that a pond 100 feet from a house poses no danger at all. The, 50 feet of support, the guy will plug his entire life. Uh, so when you boil the task down to just killing one kind of mosquito, it's an entirely different effort. The one that has such a, such a funny little, a little uh, lifespan. Uh, we get publications on promotions for officers who, who did the work, for nurses in some cases who died uh, you know, uh, uh, experimenting with, with, with the yellow fever. Uh, in some cases, pensions for survivors of the, of the, of the victims. Uh, Rough numbers that just don't mean anything. What is what is 225 million cubic yards? I mean, that's, you know, what is that? But it, it, it was it was it was such a it was a tourist attraction. People came to Panama once Yellow Fever was gone to watch the work, to watch the enormous steam shovels, to watch all the dirt being moved. It was just an incredible undertaking. But in the end, 25,000 people. Uh, and these people probably, we, if we built the Nicaraguan Canal was possible, it would have been a little more expensive. It would have taken a little longer. But these people probably wouldn't have died. There's no, there's no yellow fever in, 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 in Nicaraguan. Not much, uh, not much uh, uh, malaria either. I had lunch yesterday with a librarian from Illinois who said he was stationed in, in Panama during the early 70s. Was never bitten by a mosquito, never even saw a mosquito. 18 months. Or is that the tail end of the DDT era? So, <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Um, one final publication, uh, this is extraordinary bibliography, wow. listing hundreds, this is 1900-ish, 1901, uh, uh, basically listing what Elsie's holdings that deal huh. with the canal and the idea of the canal. Point is, all of this, canal is a fascinating, fascinating topic, and you and your patrons can be transported <laughs> on a cold winter day to, to Panama. Uh, stay away from it on a day like today. Thank you very much.